just need to take a breath every once in a while, don't you? One of those times where you just are thankful for the chance that you can just slow down and go. Because <sighs> it was a crazy week for me, no doubt a crazy week for you. On top of everything else that's going on, obviously parenting has been fun. Parenting these three kids has been a joy and a pleasure. And I'll tell you what, every once in a while, we do have challenges. Big shock, right? It's not just challenges keeping up with the kids, but in general, keeping up with the house. We discovered not too long ago that there is no shame in using paper plates. <laughs> Every once in a while, I kind of joke and say, man, I wish they made paper frying pans and, and uh, sauce pans and stuff like that. Uh, I, I, I don't know, I'd buy like a million of them, but anyway. <laughs> Paper, uh, if I can get a paper frying pan, the next best thing is to make sure that whatever I'm using can go in the? Did somebody said waste basket. <laughs> That's not a bad answer, but I'm on, I got a pastor's salary. <laughs> I can do that once and then not have, any, not have them anymore. No, we got a dishwasher. That's right. I want to know, out there, how many of you have a dishwasher? How many of you are the dishwasher? All right, there we go, there we go. So it's about 50-50 here. When I grew up, I was the dishwasher, and uh, it wasn't until after I got married that Andrew and I moved into a place that had a dishwasher, and so we started to use it. Uh, it's actually kind of fun. My mom, when she moved into her new house, she wasn't used to the dishwasher either, because she, she had been the dishwasher for like 50 years. And so for a while, when the people would come over to visit, like my brother or myself, we'd come over to visit and we'd finish lunch and we'd see the dishwasher, and so we'd toss some plates in there. And we would stay there for a couple of days and I'll never forget all of a sudden my mom looks around, she's like, where did all my plates go? Like, I can't find them anywhere. They're not in the cupboard, they're in the sink. Where could they be? Did you leave them up? They're not in the living room. Mom, dishwasher, why would you put them in there? And then she just got smart and said, you know what, that is where she's going to keep some of her fine, uh, like, not, not everyday use, like the good glass plates and the good glass cups and everything like that. She uses it as a second cupboard, but this time it, like, rolls out so it's a little bit easier. So she doesn't get it down, she has to get it up. Anyway. So when I was growing up, of course, my mom had to train me on how to wash dishes, and I still get made fun of for what I would do. When I would sit there with the sink, I, I would, I'd carefully wash the outside of the bowl because, well, there, it wasn't that hard to get it clean. And then I would fill the inside with water and just kind of let it soak. And then I would set these bowls full of water on the counter and glasses full of water on the counter. And, and, and so we'd look over it. It looked, I mean, it was just this, this pile of, it, it, it's like we're having a buffet of water, like soapy water. I couldn't quite get it figured out right. And so when I got to the dishwasher, uh, Andrea had had a lifetime of using a dishwasher, and so she had to train me. And you know what's kind of fun? I do it differently than her. I discovered this. I didn't realize that this was, this was such a thing. As I, I, I Googled it. I realized that few household chores can cause as much conflict as how to load the dishwasher. There are how-to videos on YouTube on how to load the dishwasher. I found an article on the Wall Street Journal's website from two years ago that says, you're loading the dishwasher wrong, a ch and a power struggle. It's a dishwasher, a power struggle. They did a video called loading the dishwasher, you're doing it wrong. And so let me go ahead and give you a, a, a friendly tip. For those of you who have a dishwasher and you struggle, anybody here ever have a struggle? I'll tell you what, total honesty, I normally am totally laid back and relaxed. Like There are certain things that I just absolutely don't care about when it comes to household chores. More than once, Andrea has caught me rearranging the plates in the rack because it has to go a certain way. Now, I don't know a whole lot about a whole lot, but what I do know is, by the way, handles go up, silverware goes down, right? Anybody agree with me? No, you're, handles up, silverware down. I see a couple of heads shaking. Yep, it sounds like we're gonna have a fun conversation at fellowship lunch. And so, let me give you all a handy, helpful tip 
on how to properly wash dishes. It might come in handy. I don't know if you ever end up with a dishwasher and you don't want to fight or something like that. Uh, way, 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 way down the road. <laughs> so let me help you. Step one on how to properly load the dishwasher. Uh, load it badly. Step two, listen to your husband or wife or whoever's instructions on how to properly load a dishwasher. Be attentive. Take notes. Step three, ignore those instructions and repeat step one. Step four, lose your dishwasher loading privileges. Step five, perfect. <laughs> I haven't quite been banished from doing dishwashing yet, but I'm trying. I'm doing my best. <laughs> now, no matter how you load the dishwasher or how you get your wash dishes clean, if it's by hand, by machine, uh, however you do it, the one thing we can all agree on, right? The one thing we all know for sure is that the goal is to do whatever it takes to get the correct side of the dish clean. You, we all agree that no matter if, how you put your dishes in the dishwasher, no matter how you wash your dishes, the one thing we know is that how I did it as a kid is the wrong way. I washed the outside and then just kind of let them soak on the inside and never really scrubbed on them. The most important thing is no matter what happens, you've got to make sure that the inside gets scrubbed, right? Because as beautiful and shiny as the outside might be, that's not the important part of the function of a dish. A cup, a bowl, a pot, a pan. We have to make sure that the correct side gets clean. And when we're talking this week about, surprise, surprise, baptism. What I want you to know as we do our, our sermon today is that God wants to make sure that the right part of us gets clean when we do baptisms. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we have a joyous Sabbath because in just a few minutes, we have some people who are going to give their lives to you and are going to get baptized. Some of us don't even know what baptism is all about. We've never seen it or experienced it or studied before. So as we take a few minutes to study the ceremony of baptism, Lord, help us to see it as more than just dunking in a tank. May it be about getting the right part of the person clean. Lord, help us to uh, have a relationship with you that starts from the inside. And so, Lord, as we open your word, I pray that you'd speak to us. Help us to hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I want you to open your Bibles. We're going to do a little bit of a Bible study today on baptism. Open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke, chapter 11. Gospel of Luke chapter 11. And I'll actually kind of give you guys a heads up. Right now, what are we studying for our, for our evening midweek Bible study? We're studying what book? Studying the book of Daniel. I was wrestling with what to do for 2018. What do we do? When we finish Daniel, the answer is we're going to study Luke. We're going to become experts in the Gospel of Luke, going through it a little bit at a time uh, during the week. We'll, I'm not sure if we'll do it on Monday nights or Thursday nights. We'll work out the nights. Uh, uh, when we get a little bit closer. But eventually, this church family will become experts in the Gospels. Between sermon series next year, known as the Good News Books, and in-depth Bible studies on God's Word. So you're there, you're in Luke chapter 11. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you need just another minute, say hallelujah. Everybody's there, praise the Lord. So, Luke chapter 11, down into verse 37. So this is talking about when Jesus gets together, Luke eleven thirty seven. 37, Jesus spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. Jesus was invited over to a certain Pharisee's house, and he went in and he sat down to eat. Jesus was invited to dinner. Pretty simple setting. We're okay. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he, that's Jesus, had not first washed before dinner. Now, I'm going to speak to the kids for a second. And maybe some of the grown-ups, too. How many of you are... Anybody here a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? Christians don't follow other Christians. Christians follow Jesus. 
Now, this is one time that I am not going to argue that it's okay to follow what Jesus did. Jesus was specifically trying to make a point. Just because Jesus didn't wash his hands before dinner doesn't make it okay for everybody to do so. He's doing it intentionally to get the disciples or the, this certain Pharisee talking about a point. And the point is what really needs to be clean. And so he gets into this pretty quickly. Verse 39. The Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees, you make the outside of the cup and the dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. And so what he does here is he takes that same, exact same lesson that I learned as a child about like washing the outside and ignoring the inside, and he immediately turns it into the spiritual realm. You Pharisees, you go around and you make sure to do everything on the outside so everything looks good and squeaky clean. But on the inside, you're still dirty, full of greed and wickedness. Continuing on verse 40, foolish ones, didn't he who made the outside make the inside also? But rather give alms of such things you have, that indeed all things are clean to you. But woe to you Pharisees. Jesus says, woe to you Pharisees. What specific charge does he have against them? Is it because he's mad that they're not properly keeping the Sabbath well enough or they're not tithing right, doing other good works? Or is the issue something else? Chapter 11 and verse 42, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue all the, all the manner of herbs, but you pass by the justice and love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. He's saying it's good that you're tithing, but it's not enough to just pay your dues. You're leaving the love and justice of God behind you. You're ignoring what the whole point of this is. In other words, the Pharisees became so strict at keeping the laws that they had forgotten why they had, why they had the law in the first place. They were so focused on their outward actions and what they were doing that they were ignoring the motives and the heart behind it. It's one of the things that I joke about from time to time. It's possible to do good things for bad reasons. It sure is. It is absolutely possible to do good things for bad reasons. That's why places like Walmart work so hard to give away things. It's not just for good reputation. Or that there's tax incentives, and, and it, ultimately it's a good business model for them. It's not just because they love the community so much, and I'm not going to deny that what they do, they are being nice to the community, but ultimately it's a good business model. That's why they do it. These Pharisees were doing what was good for business on the outside, but their hearts were in the wrong place. And so what they were teaching was an outward obedience without changing the heart. Jesus actually uh, says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23, he has all kinds of woes. And, and you'll see as you finish the rest of this chapter, he has all kinds of problems with them. Woe to you, for you load men with burdens that are hard to bear. Woe to you, because you, you build the tombs of the prophets, the ones that your fathers killed. Woe to you for all of the times that you had the right outward actions, but terrible reasons for doing them is effectively what he's You guys are filled on the inside with poison. And you're worried about the fact that I didn't wash my hands before dinner. How's that for signs that you are filled with poison? It's the wrong motives. The Pharisees became so strict at keeping the laws that they forgot why they had a law in the first place. So let's make this clear. God gave us a law, right? If God gives us the law, if God gives us something, it's good, right? I'm not saying the law isn't good. But what we do with it, that's where we start to get into problems. We don't keep the law because it'll make God love us more. That's not why we are obedient and have outward actions. It's not to impress God, to make him love us more. My encouragement is for each of us to start on the inside. We keep the law because it'll help us to love God more, us love him more, to help build our relationship with him, to transform our hearts, 
God is love. His law is all about love. If you want to know how to love God more, this is some of the things you can do. My wife tells me that the proper way to load the dishwasher is this, this, this. If I love her, I will do it, even if I don't agree with her. <laughs> because it's not what I want to do, it's what she wants me to do, because that's the loving thing. I want to have a loving relationship with her, and so my love drives my actions, not the other way around. It's not that my actions are going to drive my love or her love for me. In fact, just a little fun tip here. For those of you who are trying to reach out to somebody, God calls us to do certain things at certain times. The, to do the love. And we are supposed to do it even if that person doesn't respond to us with love. Even if we don't get the benefits out of it that we are hoping to get out of it. And that doesn't excuse us then from turning around and saying, well, we tried it, I don't have to do it anymore. They didn't respond the way that they were supposed to, but I tried, I'm good. Because the command isn't to make somebody else happy. The command isn't to convert somebody else. The command is to be faithful to, to what God has told you to do. And as long as told, God has told you to do something for somebody, well, you better do it. Because you're not doing it for them, you're doing it for him. Amen. So, it isn't about obedience in order to earn God's favor. That's what the Pharisees were doing. That's what Jesus said was wrong. They're focused on the outside. Jesus wants us to start on the inside. And Jesus wasn't the only preacher who wanted us to start on the inside. There was another person who was preaching changes from the inside. A certain man named John the Baptist. Anybody ever heard of John the Baptist? Did Jesus ever hear of John the Baptist? Were they, I don't know, did they know each other? They were cousins, right. Here's something that is amazing to me. Flip back a couple of pages earlier in the Gospel of Luke to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, starting at verse 1. This is the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. You do the math. You look it up on Wikipedia. This is 27 AD. And I'm not even going to go through those names because you don't care about those names. And, and there's no point in stumbling over them. We'll just jump down to Luke chapter 3 and verse 3. When you're there, say amen. amen. Need another minute, say hallelujah. Everybody's there. Praise the Lord. So, he went into the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. John the Baptist had a unique ministry. It was special in, in those days. It caught people's attention, and it revolved around baptism. What was unique about his teaching about baptism was that it was just a new ceremonial way to wash the skin. He'd come up with a new custom on how to cleanse yourself before a meal. Or was it that he was trying to teach people to cleanse their insides, to repent from their sins? Isn't that what the text says? And here's something that is amazing when you step back and think about it. How many sermons had Jesus preached at this point? To the best of our knowledge that's recorded in the Gospels, zero. Jesus' public ministry doesn't start until after his baptism, which is later on in this chapter. So I don't want you to miss this. Before Jesus started preaching about the kingdom of God and repentance and all of this stuff, the people themselves started to realize that there is something wrong with the system we have now. The people, before Jesus began his ministry, they were led by the Holy Spirit to realize their need for cleansing from their sins. The people caught on to this before Jesus preached his first sermon. Because God was starting to impress upon them that the, the, the animal sacrifice, you know, the sacrificial system that we studied earlier this year. The animal sacrifices, they were doing little to help people draw closer to God. People weren't building their relationships with him. It just became cold, formal ritual. It was all outward actions with very little inward change. People had no problem killing an animal and then going back to doing the exact same sins that they had been doing before. And all of a sudden they realized, something isn't right here. Something is not right. We've got to change this. There, was, there had been no miracles from Jesus, no sermons from Jesus. It was all the Holy Spirit pressing upon them the need to change their ways. 
And so what does John say? Skip down a couple of verses to verse 8. The call from John was this. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. And don't say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up, to chil or raise up children to Abraham from these stones. It's not enough to simply look like a good church person and perhaps even to claim the family of a good church person. It's not good enough for Hannah that her parents have been baptized. It's not good enough for some of us in here, that our kids have been baptized. What doesn't matter is if you're second generation or third generation or fourth generation or fifth generation Christian, Adventist, whatever. The most important thing is to be first generation, that you've got it for yourself. And so what he's saying here is it's not good enough to just say, well, Abraham's my, God, or my father, and so I'm in. We're going to have a family reunion. What matters is that God is your father and you have a direct relationship with him. So how do you get that? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. This is now the second time we've seen this word. What is repentance? Well, the way that I like to picture it is you're traveling through life and you're going forward and everything's good. You're pressing forward and all of a sudden something shiny gets your attention, right? Anybody here? Did something shiny get your attention? I don't know what it is. It might be something on TV, something on music, something at a store, something edible. But whatever it is, you're, you're traveling through life, and you're good, and then all the... Whoa. That's pretty cool looking. And so you're supposed to be going that way. But then you start to travel off this way a little bit, and that is really interesting right there. You are off track. You are going the wrong way. Repentance is when God and his spirit call up behind you and say, um, hey, uh, you, 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 uh, hello, can you hear me? I don't want to have to redirect like the GPS. You need to get back on path. And the best way to do it is to turn around. And that's literally what the Hebrew imagery is for repentance, is to turn around. And so that's what they want you to do. You're heading someplace you really shouldn't be headed. And God says, hey, you're not headed where you're supposed to be going. Turn around. That's the call for people. So I don't know what has you slightly off track. But we all have something that is leading us astray. We all have something that is trying to drag us off of, of the course that God has for us in our lives. And so the appeal is repent. Turn, get back on track. And that was the call that they made time and time again to repent. Repent isn't just an outward change in actions, though. Because some of our sins, in fact, dare I say, all of our sins, start on the inside. We make a choice in our hearts that we are going to deviate from God and that our actions follow. Some of us haven't yet put our actions into practice, but our hearts have long made that decision. There are sins that start in the heart and just bubble for a while, and only tiny ways will manifest themselves on the outside. The call to concern is to start from the heart. And here's the great thing. No matter what your sin is, Jesus can save you from it. No matter what is trying to lead you astray and what has caught you off path, Jesus can set you free from it. Anybody thankful for that? But don't misunderstand me. When I say we are saved from our sins, that's different than saying we are saved in our sins. We're not supposed to just continue going on like nothing has ever happened, or like nothing is different. I got a dog. My dog loves to roll in the mud and other brown stuff. And every once in a while, she gets a bath. But do I do the bath outside in a mud puddle? No. Because there's no point in washing the dog in a mud puddle. I've got to pick her up, take her inside. I've heard it said 
that it would be like trying to brush your teeth while still eating Oreos. You take the dog out, saved from that situation, then made clean, and then just hope and pray she doesn't do it again. She's a dog, she does. But God wants to hope that you're better than the dog, right? We all have the mud puddle that we like to roll in, something filthy that gets our attention. And it's just kind of fun to play in. Jesus picks us up, pulls us out, cleans us up, washes us off, and now goes and says over and over again in scriptures, those famous words, now go and sin no more. He says, I've made you clean. Now stop playing in the mud. When we continue to study through this chapter, Luke chapter 3, something awesome happens. Luke chapter 3 and verse 21, I mentioned this earlier. All the people were baptized. It came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. Now this is the point where I say, if you're a Christian, you do like Jesus did. Amen. If Jesus was baptized, so should we. But why was Jesus baptized? With all this talk of repentance, how did Jesus react to baptism? He accepted it, didn't he? And did God look at him and say, now hold on a second, Jesus. You didn't need to get baptized. Did Jesus need to get baptized? It was all about repentance. He didn't need to get baptized, why not? He never sinned. But you know what's interesting? It's not only did God not condemn him or was upset with him, though he was baptized, though he never sinned, the very next words that come out of heaven. You see a Holy Spirit descend upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. This isn't just about cleansing from our sinful actions. The goal of baptism is to build a relationship. And this is a public declaration that we have a relationship with God. The point of a baptism isn't just that you can get another shower today or another bath today. If it was, I'd bring, I would have brought my axe body wash with me. The goal is inward, heart changes. I liken baptism to a wedding. I love my wife. She knows that, I know that. And that was good enough for us, right? So we loved each other, and we had our own little relationship, and so we didn't bother to tell anybody. There was no point in, in, in I don't know, doing anything formal about it. It was just good enough that we knew we had a relationship, right? No. I couldn't help but want to tell everybody I've got a relationship. And even more than that, to actually step back and say, not only do I want to have, or I have a relationship, I want to have a relationship with you forever. And so I am going to step up publicly and tell everybody, I'm going to take a vow and say, for better or for worse, sickness and in health, even when we misload the dishwasher, till death do us part. And I know it's not easy. I heard a, I heard a funny joke. Relationships aren't going to automatically always be easy. If they were automatically always going to be easy, then you wouldn't have to stand up and take a vow that says, I will be together until one of us dies. But the goal here, like a marriage, is to say, you know what? I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm going to keep growing. I'm going to keep trying. I wasn't a perfect boyfriend when Andrea and I got married. I'm still not a perfect husband. Andrew will agree with that. But I'm trying. I'm growing. And that's what a relationship is all about. And in the same way, baptism. JD, Pat, you're not perfect, are you? If you were perfect, this baptism would get really hard because we'd try to get you in the water. 
top, right? <laughs> so we'll find out in just a few minutes if you're perfect. If you're perfect and you walk across the top, just keep going, stand on the platform and watch. But if you go into the water, if you need to get baptized, you're not perfect. But the encouragement is that you're saying publicly in front of all of these people, I love Jesus. I want to have a relationship with him till death do us part. And here's the great thing with Jesus. Jesus can actually promise a little bit longer than that. Eternal life. That's right. Jesus died for us so that we might have an eternal relationship. And this is one of the things that I like about the form of the baptism. It's an actual, like, burying process. Um, yeah, let me jump ahead to that verse. There's a burying process. It's related to the fact that Jesus himself died and rose again. Colossians 2.12, you would be buried with him in baptism. You see, we don't practice baptism by sprinkling. We don't back practice baptism, uh, you know, we don't just get up and do a nice public ceremony, shake your hand, uh, all of that stuff. You actually get into the water, you go under the water. And I, I'm going to borrow Alan for a second. I need somebody to help, help with this here. Think about how we do baptism. When we do baptism, I hope you guys are paying attention too, what we normally do is he's going to grab my arm, and then he's going to grab my arm again. And when we do baptism, how do we do it? You bury somebody in the water, right? And so, bend at the knees, it'll be easier to, you lower your center of gravity, you won't slip. Okay? So, he goes down. He is buried under the water. If I don't pick him up, he's, he's not coming up, is he? He's a goner. Jesus was a goner when he died on the cross. But did he stay in his tomb? Was he, when he was buried, did he stay there forever? Did not. He came up. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> he rose again. Just like you guys are going to come up out of the water and have a new life. Just like Jesus. And so that's what I'm looking forward to. And that's what I'm excited about. This isn't just about the water. This isn't just about the outward stuff. John the Baptist makes this clear. Luke chapter 3 and verse 16. John says, I indeed baptize you with water, but there's one who is mightier than I that is coming, he says, whose sandal strap I'm not even worthy to loose. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The Holy Spirit is going to come and dwell in you. Is going to live in you. Is going to give you strength on the inside. Not just to wash off the outside, but strength on the inside to make good choices so that you don't defile yourself on the inside. He's going to fill you with fire. He's going to make you be on fire for him. You're going to want to go around and you've got this new relationship and you're going to be, you're just going to be on fire. When you have a new something, when you have something exciting in your life, what do you just got to do? You got to share it, right? He's going to put a fire in you that you're going to just be so happy. You can't help but want to tell other people. I mean, look at this. Pat made a decision that she wants to love Jesus Christ and she wants to have a relationship with him. And she was so on fire, she had to start calling people. And we got a whole row of people here with her now because of how much she loves Jesus. And so I'm glad you're here with us today. <laughs> Remember, when you talk about baptism, what we want to do is we want to make sure that God gets the right parts of us clean. And so as I prepare you guys to get ready into the, to get into the tank here, it's not just about getting washed on your skin. May God create in you a clean and new heart. And I'll deal with them and their decisions in just a minute. But what I know, baptized or not, ready to be a part of this church or not, today, is there anybody out there who wants to have a clean heart with God? Anybody want to have a relationship with him where he will wash you clean on your inside? Amen. I know some of you might have just made that decision for the first time. And you want to talk to me because you, you might be interested in, in doing something similar to what we're about to do. Others of you, it's been a long time since you've thought about your relationship and your heart with God. 
You might be interested in doing something known as rebaptism, like JD is going to do. Come and talk to me later. For others of you, I hope and pray that every single day you'll say, hey, what God, you know what, God? I made mistakes yesterday. I made bad choices yesterday. I have sinned. I've blown it. Wash me clean today. Set me free from my sins today so that I can get it. I, I, I'll do it right this time. Ask that God would give you the strength to be made clean day after day. So this is the point now where I ask Pat and JD to come forward because we got a little bit of business to deal with. Got a little business to deal with here. So come on up here. Come on up, 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 up. I have a quiz for you. It's a fun quiz. Pat, let me see. You need a hand. Yep. Come on up. Come on up. Very good. Come on over. Perfect. I've got a quiz for you. The answer is either yes or no. Is that clear? Yes. Hey, you passed the test. <laughs> Although, let, let me help you out. The microphone can't hear nodding. Okay? <laughs> so, Here's your quiz, 13 questions. I just want to check and see how you all are doing. And I know that I've talked to you about them privately and individually. Um, I know, you know, over the years we've seen evidence of this. I just want to make sure we're okay. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has something known as baptismal vows. These are our, uh, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health and all of that, these are the things that we want people to have in a relationship with Jesus. And so, the first and foremost, do you believe in God the Father, in His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Spirit? Yes. Yes. Well, that's step one. That's pretty good. <laughs> do you accept the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary as the atoning sacrifice for the, men's of sin, for the bleh, sins of men? And do you believe that through faith in His shed blood that men are saved from sin and its penalty? Do you believe that Jesus is the Savior who can set people free? Yes. Yes. Renouncing the world and its sinful ways. Have you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? And do you believe that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven your sins and given you a new heart? Yes. 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 All right. Do you accept by faith the righteousness of Christ, recognizing him as your intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary? Big fancy words. You can tell a bunch of theologians wrote this. Do you claim his promise to strengthen you by his indwelling spirit so that you can receive power to do his will? Basically, what I'm asking you is, do you promise, or do you, do you accept that Jesus is going to come into you and to give you strength to do what he wants you to do? Yes. Do you believe that the Bible is God's inspired word and that it constitutes the only rule of faith and practice for the Christian? Yes. Do you accept the Ten Commandments as still binding upon Christians? Is it your purpose by the power of the indwelling Christ to keep the law, including the Fourth Commandment, which requires the observance of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord your God? Yeah. Yes. And as a reminder, what we just talked about here, the goal isn't to do it for the sake of getting God to like you more. It's do it because you love God. And these are the things that God says, if you love me, this is what you're going to do. Is the soon coming of Jesus the blessed hope in your heart? And are you determined to be personally ready to meet the Lord and to do all in your power to witness to his loving salvation by life and work and, and others, to help others to be ready for his glorious appearing? Are you excited for Jesus to come again? And do you want to help others to be, to be excited too? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you accept the biblical teaching of spiritual gifts? And do you believe that the gift of prophecy in the remnant church is one of the identifying marks of that church? If you've been going through the book of Revelation, that's one of the things that we've studied is the gift of prophecy. But do you believe that Jesus and his spirit are still working in the church and giving people gifts? Yes. Yes. Do you believe in God's remnant church and is it your purpose to support the church by your tithes, offerings, personal effort, and influence? Are you going to invest in God's church with your time and all that he's given to you? Yes. And you both have proven that time and time again. Amen? Yeah. Oh, here's the long one. Let me take a deep breath here. 
Do you believe that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? I could stop here, but we get very specific now. That you are to honor God by caring for your body, avoiding the use of that which is harmful, things such as abstaining from all unclean foods, from the use, manufacture, or sale of alcoholic beverages, from the use, manufacture, or sale of tobacco in any of its forms for human consumption, or the misuse of or trafficking in narcotics and other drugs. Do you believe that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and want to watch over it accordingly? Yes. yes. Knowing and understanding the fundamental Bible principles as taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is it your purpose, by the grace of God, to live your life in harmony with the principles of our community? Yes. yes. All right. Do you accept the New Testament teaching of baptism by immersion? And do you desire to be so baptized as a public expression of your faith in Christ and in the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. yes. If you didn't want to get baptized, we wouldn't be standing here right now. <laughs> Last but not least, do you believe that the, or that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy as spoken of in Revelation 12, 17? And do you believe that people of every nation, every race, every language are invited and accepted into its fellowship? And do you desire to be a member of this local church, of the world church? Yes. Yes. So those are the 13 vows. They passed the test, I would say. You heard there at the end a request to be members of this local church. JD already is, and so this is a recommitment for him. But for Pat, this is something new. And so, pending baptism, church family, is there anybody out there who says, I want to accept Pat into the body of, of the church? We want to make a motion that pending her baptism, I'll take one as a first and one as a second, and all in favor, God's people said? Amen. Amen. I'll take that as a carried. So pending your baptism, Pat. We will love to accept you into our fellowship, but now it is actually time for our uh, baptism, but not like this. We've got to go get changed. In the meantime, you're going to sing a song. And I think very fittingly, as we studied that Jesus went down to the Jordan River to get baptized, so too shall we gather at the river. And that's our closing song today. Number 432. Let's go get changed. Go get changed. You're going to head into, yep, come on down. Come on down. We're going to get changed and come right back and do this baptism in just a minute here. So let's help Pat. She's good. I invite you to stand and sing number 432, Shall We Gather at the River? <laughs> 